The body is not ours. Now, yes, we, God gave us responsibility over our body while we're alive. But that, that's, that responsibility ends when we die. Then the body goes back to God completely. It's his domain. It's his object. We have no say over it. Just like I can go to my neighbor's table and make a dent on it because it's his table. I have no ownership over it. I have no responsibility over it. Same here. When I die, I have no ownership or responsibility over my body anymore. It belongs to God. And therefore, things become a little more complicated. Now, yes, as mentioned, we hold life and the, the, the ability to save lives as the highest virtue in Judaism. But it depends really whether our organ donation after we die is really being dedicated to that virtue. Because there are multiple things to be taken into consideration here. Number one, sometimes we do donate an organ and it ends up in a lab um, and it's never used. So I gave a piece of a body that really is a mine, has explained, to something that will never be used. That could be problematic. Uh, if it goes to really save a life, then great. If I know that it's going to save a life, but if it's just going to sit on a lab and who knows, or maybe it's used for research that eventually ends up being futile, maybe, maybe it's not that, then I have no authority to, to really donate any organs again because that's not my body anymore. And it's not going to save a life. That's one thing to take into consideration. By the way, I know some places around, around the world, in Israel, uh, it's certainly the case, but if you have to sign on a card where you donate, uh, where you agree to donate your organs, then uh, there is a little footnote that says that uh, they will have to consult with your rabbi beforehand. And if, if your rabbi can be involved in the process and then ensure that that organ that you are donating indeed is going to save a life, then great. But again, if it's left in the field of the unknown, then uh, it's, it could be problematic. That's number one. Number two, there is an organ in particular that is very problematic. And that organ is the heart itself because the heart still has to be pumping from what I understand. So it has to be alive in order to, for it to be valid for transplant. And um, we consider, Judaism considers a person dead only once the heart is gone. Not when the brain is gone, but when the heart is gone. And if the heart is not gone, will technically be killing a person, taking his a heart that is alive to give it to someone else. And I'm not allowed to take my own life. I'm not allowed to take anyone's life. So that's why the heart is indeed problematic. Um, so that's another thing to take into consideration. Uh, a third thing to take into consideration is that, uh, you know, sometimes, again, relating to what is considered dead in Judaism, and we said it's the heart uh, that needs to be dead, not necessarily the brain, but sometimes hospitals will consider a person that's brain dead, dead. And then they'll be able, if you signed a card like that, donating your organs, then they'll say, well, you're dead anyhow, so let's just take care of the other organs uh, and donate any organ because that person in our eyes is considered to be dead. Well, in Judaism's eyes, that person is not considered to be dead. And therefore, any taking out of org any any organs that might be take taken out of the person at that stage could endanger the person's life because again, the person's life is not ended yet. So it could precipitate the death of the heart, which is the death according to Judaism that we relate to. And therefore, that too can be a problem. So um, these are things really to consider and that halakhic authorities are considering as we speak because it's such a complex issue. But my suggestion would be that if there is a way legally to write, as mentioned, that you are willing to donate your organs, but only with the full authorization of a halakhic authority or of a rabbinic authority, <clears throat> rabbinic authority, of course, that knows and, and um, can rule on these laws, then, then yes, then great. But otherwise, if that can't be executed and you cannot know for sure where your organs are being donated, whether they are really going to, to save lives, then again, it's problematic and that's where Jewish law stands. So that's the very general answer to a very complex issue, but I try to give you some things to think about. And again, this is 
above my pay grade, as they say. And I would, uh, um, you know, if you if you really are, are interested in delving more into this, I'm happy to send you some resources, and at the same time also refer you to really the experts. I know one in particular, Rabbi Weitzman um, from Machon Pua in Jerusalem, is an expert in this field, and I'm happy to refer you to to those experts too. Um, thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Arian. I hope I hope it answered the question somehow. Okay. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. All right. Next question. Rabbi, so I have a question on this. Uh, maybe you said something about it, but aren't we supposed to bury the body in full, like a full body where you cannot take any parts off? Because I know like in Israel, when there's a suicide yeah, bomb, I mean, yeah. every part of the body again is sacred because it belongs to God. Now, therefore, yeah, every single part of the body needs to be buried, even if, God forbid, the, the body can be, uh, you know, uh, found in different parts. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I'm talking about organ donation, though, whether those organs then, uh, whether you separate them intentionally or they were already separated before that, whether they're able to be donated. That's the question. Right. Because in this one, they even collect that. Uh, what do they call it? Hatsala? Remember they spoke Yeah, Hatsala, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I absolutely. have a question, Rabbi. Yes, yeah, Sue. What if the death is um, suspicious and they have to do an autopsy? Is that a lot? That's a question. So that's a different question. Again, autopsy is not something that is recommended in Judaism. Um, we're quite against autopsy. Again, because of the same reason. The body is not ours anymore. We can't just play around with it. It's God's domain. And we, I know. Ought to, we ought to exercise utmost respect to the body. Therefore, autopsy is not allowed. Now, I understand that in some cases, there's no way to, to, to avoid it. And right. we should try to avoid it. Uh, but sometimes it's, it's impossible. In Israel, I know they're very, very accommodating. Outside of Israel, where they don't quite understand the Jewish perspective, it's much harder to fight for it. But when right. one can, they should try to fight for it. To, but to if it goes that. to the medical examiner because it's yeah. a suspicious right. death. Sometimes, yeah, and sometimes there's nowhere to go. But we should certainly try to fight for it. Yeah. Okay, next question. Dear Rabbi, a question continues to arise. What would the Talmud of sages say regarding being in relationships with people one truly likes, but whose core values are completely different than ours? Okay, so it's a great question. And with our um, political climate, I think that uh, this question is very, very relevant, whether it's because of political issues, or as you said, the core values themselves are very different. Can I engage in a relationship with a person who has different values, different uh, perspectives on life altogether? What, what does Judaism have to say about this? Well, uh, I will say this. You asked about what the Talmud says. Well, the sages themselves engage constantly with people who were different than them. Now, let's categorize them into separate categories. You had their peers who were, who were different than them. Talmudic sages whose peers were different than them. The, the classic example is Hillel and Shammai. They were very different. Their outlook on life was very different. They were very different. Yet, it says that the students of Hillel and the students of Shammai married with one another. They had very, very close relationships with one another because they understood what Judaism always understood. And that is that the disagreements can be disagreements of ideas, not disagreements of people themselves. We can disagree without becoming disagreeable as people say. We can fight ideas, but we can't fight people. We have to know how to differentiate between thoughts and the thought process itself and the heart and the oneness that exists in each and every human being just simply because we are all creations of God. And uh, we find that among Talmudic sages, among their peers, another category is strangers that were not necessarily among their peers. My neighbor, my neighbor here in Scottsdale could be very different than me. I have a neighbor who's very different, who has a huge cross in his entrance and he's, he's actually a, a Christian Muslim, Christian Arab, sorry very different. So does that mean I can't engage in a relationship with a person like that? Absolutely. Judaism would say you could. Because again, we welcome diversity of opinions. 
and 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 we, we are never against people themselves. Even if those people are sinners, we spoke about this a little bit on Sunday during our soul class. Judaism teaches to, to hate. Hate is a strong word, but to, 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 to ask for the sins to be abolished and not the sinners themselves. Is this famous story that we quoted on Sunday about Rabbi Meir who was bullied by his own neighbors and he prayed one day that God should kill them. And his wife heard his prayer and said, Rabbi Meir, I'm surprised. Shouldn't you ask that God uh, abolishes the, the sins of those sinners, not the sinners themselves? And he said to her, you know what? You're right. Itamu chata'im and not chotim in the Hebrew words. Let those sins of those sinners go away, not the sinners themselves. So we have to know how to differentiate that. You know that um, in the mitzvah of tefillin, there's something that needs to be noted in this regard. And that is that it's interesting to note that the head tefillin are divided into four different segments. And you have four different parchments in the head tefillin. All of these four parchments are the four sources in the Torah that speak about this mitzvah of tefillin. In the hand tefillin, you have those four different texts, but they're all rolled into one piece, into one parchment, all written on one parchment, and they're all rolled into one box, into just one segment right here. Now, why? Why the difference between the hand to fill in and the head to fill in? Why is it divided up here? And here it's one. And the answer, according to uh, Rabbi Miel, who was the chief rabbi of, of uh, Tel Aviv, not Rabbi Claude Amiel in our community, a different <laughs> Rabbi Amiel in the 1930s in Tel Aviv, he gave a beautiful answer. And he said, that's because when it comes to the head, then diversity of opinion is welcome. We should have at least four different opinions. But when it comes to the hand that represents action, we should act as one. And it's true in relationships. It's true in just you know uh, uh, simple encounters that we have with people. We can face people that are very different with their values and with their opinions, but we can still find some oneness, some unity with them, a unity of heart. You know, um, at the funeral of the three boys, um, three boys right up here uh, that were kidnapped and murdered in the summer of 2014. Rabbi Zinger, who we had the privilege of meeting in our community, he was the head of, he's the head of the Mekor Chaim Yeshiva, where two of the three boys studied, Rabbi Shtal says Yeshiva, and uh, he spoke about the unity among the Jewish people during those three weeks in which everyone was searching for those boys after they were kidnapped. And eventually they found them, fortunately, dead in, in some abandoned field next to Hebron. But he said that this unity should serve as an inspiration for the future, that we should remember. And he quoted that famous line that the two Jews, there, are, there might be two Jews with three opinions, but we have one heart. Two Jews, three opinions, but one heart. And these three weeks proved that oneness of the heart. And therefore, I say, that, you know, if we have to go to the Talmudic sages to find examples, or even to contemporaries of ours to find examples, but there are many. I know that the Lubavitcher Rebbe himself was a person who despised uh, pointing fingers at people and, and Xing out people themselves. Yes, he would X out ideas, ideologies, but he would never X out people. My dear friend, Shmuley Green, whose father is a professor at NASA, and I've, I've shared this story many times, but he was just becoming more and more observant and closer to his Chabad rabbi in Minnesota. And at one point he found as a scientist, Professor Green is, is, is really one of the best, uh, um, was, he passed away a few years ago, but was one of the best uh, infection scientists in the world. We would need him today with the coronavirus. But um, he found that there were many, many what he thought were points of friction between the Torah and science. So he wrote a whole letter to the Rebbe about it. And the Rebbe never didn't respond. Three years later, he wrote, and they kept in touch, of course, three years later, he wrote a letter to the Rebbe about how he became even more observant and how his children now go to Jewish camps and so on. Then the Rebbe wrote to him, I'm so happy that you have made these strides in your Jewish journey. P.S. Here are the answers to all the questions that you asked. The three-page letter answering all the questions that he asked three years before. And then the Rebbe wrote to him, you may be wondering why I waited all this time to answer your questions. 
That is because my job in life is not to win arguments. My job in life is to bring people closer to the Torah and mitzvot. Now that I see that you became closer to the Torah and mitzvot, we can have a discussion about this. And that shares, of course, volumes about uh, the, the relationships that Judaism encourages. We could disagree with people. You know, just one more example about the Lubavitcher Rebbe. I remember that Alan Dershowitz wrote about this and how he was very upset at the Lubavitcher Rebbe in 1984 because some Chabad organization had honored Jesse Helms, who was a senator at the time, was very anti-Israel. And he wrote to the Rebbe, how could you honor such a man who vilifies our people and vilifies our, our country? Or Israel. And uh, the Rebbe wrote to him that I've always been of the opinion that you do not dismiss people. First, he explained that he was honored with other senators, but also that I've always been of the opinion that you do not dismiss people because of their opinion. A few months after that, Jesse Helms made a 180 degree turn and he served on an important committee in the Senate. I forget which one. And he was one of the most pro-Israel advocates. Why? Because he was one of the greatest rabbis of all times. He understood that relationships means relationships with people, not with their ideas. I can disagree with them, but I cannot become, or they cannot become disagreeable in my eyes. And as long as we can cultivate this love, then the relationship can be deepened. And eventually also the relationship can influence uh, in, the, in the most positive way. So <clears throat> that's to answer that question. Okay, next question. Uh, dear Rabbi, I hope your day is going well. Here's my question. As a child, when questioning an adult regarding the origin of God, I recall someone explaining that God is like a ball, then describing a round ball has no beginning and no end. I am curious how you yourself, Rabbi, in your mind, envision how God came into being, recognizing that as you have taught so many times, the finite cannot comprehend the infinite. But perhaps you have your own way of helping us comprehend the incomprehensible. So it's a great question. No, I don't have as vivid of an image as um, uh, that person explained it to you when uh, you were small. Uh, but I will say this, that God never came into being. And the word origin of God does not apply to God. God was always and will always be. In the word of God himself, Yud, He, and Vav, and He, we have the three tenses of Hayah, Hove, Ve, past, present, and future. And that's something that's almost, not almost, that's something that's impossible for the human mind to comprehend. If I had to give an image to it, uh, some type of vision to it, I would, um, I would go for a much easier image. And I uh, would go to your field, Jordan, where you see it every day. Babies being born is to me the greatest image of God himself. Something coming from almost nothing. And in a way that's God. There was nothing before this world, yet he was there. In that nothingness, something emerged and there he was again just like babies, there was nothing. And then that nothingness, from that nothingness, something emerged and there was God again, God before and the God after. And that evokes the words of the prayer that we say each and every morning before Hodu in the very first part of the prayer, which is known as sacrifices called Banot. It says, that God, you are one before you created this world and there was nothing and you are one, you remain that same one after you created this world. So maybe that image of birth is, uh, is an image that gives us a sense of, of what you're speaking about. Okay. All right, next question. Uh, I've heard that when we do a mitzvah, we improve the world. I understand that we can improve the world by doing mitzvahs like giving tzedakah, visiting the sick, etc. But how is the world improved by doing things that are more intangible, like lighting Shabbat candles or saying prayers? So that's a great question. Yes, we can see that the world is being changed when we visit the sick. The sick is 
is, is smiling, it's, it's, it's impacting a life. We can see that the world is changing when we're giving tzedakah because a poor person now has money to eat and you've changed the life. But how Shabbat candles, how does that change a life? Saying prayers, how does that change a life? So for that, I think we have to go to the mystical world and understand that uh, there are things that the eye can see, but there are things that the eye cannot see. And sometimes they are made, they are revealed to us, that dimension is revealed to us, the dimension that the eye cannot see is revealed to us, sometimes it's not. But uh, lighting Shabbat candles and saying a prayer relate to that dimension that the eye cannot see, that in short, again, according to Kabbalah, speaks of how every mitzvah brings God's light, God's Shekhinah, God's divine presence to this world. And that there's a divinity that is being invited into the sphere of this world when we perform a mitzvah, especially a mitzvah that God instructs us to do, like praying or like lighting Shabbat candles or welcoming or, or, or the Shabbat or, or doing Shabbat itself. Now, these are not tangible things, but again, there's that light. Now, Again, sometimes it's revealed to us. I mean, I've said this many times. You can walk into a home and feel whether immediately almost, whether it's a home of tension or whether it's a home of peace. Now, why? Not because the walls of tension have blood on the, <laughs> um, the home of tension is blood on its walls or something like that, but simply because there's an energy that is felt that, gosh, you feel like suffocated. But the house of peace, a home of peace feels very different because again, that divine energy is very, very real, although we cannot see it. Now, I'm gonna take this a step further. And I'm gonna say that every mitzvah, especially again, the mitzvahs that are not necessarily social justice mitzvahs, because sometimes those social justice mitzvahs are man-made. The, the, the mitzvahs of the Torah are God-made. So sometimes just doing a mitzvah and therefore bringing that God that instructed you to do the mitzvah into the world, brings the world this much closer to its ultimate redemption. Why? Because it's all part of one big pattern, one big pattern that has started from the beginning of time. That is God created this world in order for us to better it. Now, when the world will, out, out, will reach its ultimate state of betterment, that's when Mashiach will come. Now, every mitzvah that we do, that God instructed us to do, is a mitzvah that again adds betterment to this world, adds this divine energy, draws it down. And it draws it down closer and closer until the, finally the whole entire presence of God will be able to come down to this world and then redeem it. So every mitzvah is really pulling that, that rope, so to speak, a little bit closer, an inch closer, an inch closer, till finally we'll have the entire God himself come down and that will be the times of Mashiach. So that's really the Kabbalistic dimension of the impact of our mitzvahs, whether they are tangible or not. And this is why Maimonides says that a person should always view himself as, as a person that can influence the entire world. And he, should, he writes as follows, that we should see the world as if it's on a scale. One mitzvah can tip the scale and bring ultimate redemption to the world. God forbid, one sin can tip the scale and bring destruction to the world. By the way, if we needed any proof for this intangible effect that we can have on others, then ask someone to sneeze on you today. Let's see what happens. Not just on you, but let's see what happens in China or in other places in the world. One intangible mitzvah can indeed have a positive impact, just like one tiny 125 nanometers virus can have a tiny, uh, huge impact on the, a negative impact on the entire world. That's what happens each time we do a mitzvah. And therefore, those intangible mitzvahs like Shabbat candles really can make a huge impact on the entire world. Now you ask the question in the context of the impact on the world, but I, I, if I dare just deviate a little bit and say also that there is no doubt that lighting Shabbat candles has an impact certainly on the home in which the Shabbat candles are lit. It, 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 these are candles of peace, as Maimonides also writes about Shabbat candles, and they certainly enhance the peace in the home, the light in the home. And it's not just Shabbat candles, any mitzvah that we do, 
influences not just the world, but the home that we live in, and of course, eventually ourselves. I conclude with a story I, I reread in, in uh, Elie Wiesel's memoirs. But he evokes a Hasidic story about this man who find out what the truth was by his Hasidic master. And he decided to go and preach it to the world. And in some places they heard, they listened to him, some places they didn't. And there was a bar in his town of people who never listened to anything. And he decided, I'm gonna go there every night and shout out the truth of God and the truth that I just uh, discovered. And, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll show them what it means. <clears throat> and he did that every single night. After many nights, someone comes to him and says, hey, excuse me, Hasidic Jew, can't you see that your words are not having any impact on anybody here? Just go back to your home. He said, you're right. They might not have any impact on any one year, but they have an impact on me. And if I need to shout them just to remind myself of that truth, then let it be. And sometimes we think that our mitzvahs did not have any impact. They do. It's not like this story. They do. But still, if you're discouraged because you can't see it, then think about the impact it's having on you. And then those mitzvahs will no doubt continue to create positivity in the world and in your life. Okay, next question. Okay, since Black Friday is coming up, I have a question about shopping. <laughs> okay, um, you know, Black Friday, by the way, started, today's Tuesday, a lot of the stores already started their discounts. They don't wait till the Black Friday anymore. But in any case, so say I walk into a clothing store and ask the sales staff for advice on which type of shirt is best for my needs. The guy spends half an hour explaining the pros and cons of all of the different shirts. I say thank you and walk out of the store, then go online and order the exact shirt he recommended, but at a much cheaper price. Am I being dishonest? So it's a good question. You walk into a store and the salesman dedicates half an hour to explain to you what type of shirt, but you don't intend to buy it. All you need to know is whether that shirt fits you. And then you go online and you buy for much cheaper uh, price. Are you being dishonest? So, so let me explain that there is one of the 10 commandments as we all know is do not steal. Lot Igzol. Now, uh, the rabbis explain that stealing does not just mean stealing of actual property. If I steal a cup from someone, that's absolutely stealing. But there's other types of stealing. And that is the stealing of mind, gnevat da'at. There's also stealing of time, gnevat zman. And there's other types of stealing. What's gnevat da'at? Leading the person, stealing of mind, leading the person, making him think in his mind that you are going to buy that shirt, but you have no intention whatsoever to buy that shirt, is gnevat da'at. You just stole his mind. And that's just as severe as and stealing property. And we have to be very careful about it. Now you can say, well, anyway, that's his job. He, he anyway, I mean, he has to attend to other customers anyway, the customers like me anyway. So what's the difference? I mean, they get, he's getting paid to answer questions, like the questions I'm asking him. Well, maybe during that time, first he could have been with another customer that could have brought him some money and maybe he gets commission of every seller, whether he does, does or doesn't, but you're stealing from the store because the the, the, the employee is not being channeled in the right way. And, and even if not, you're still stealing. Now, of course, you're also stealing his time. You stole half an hour from his time. And not you, I'm saying, theoretically, if you do this, you stole half an hour from his time. That's also precious. Time doesn't, doesn't come back. It's, not, it's even worse than property. Because maybe if I stole a cup, I can return it. Time, I can never return. You know, Aristotle would ask his students often, what is the teacher? That is the best teacher in life, but it kills all of its students. Then he would say time, time. Time gives you that experience, but by the time you obtain that experience, it already killed you. <laughs> so it's time. And it's true, time never comes back. So in a way, stealing time is even more, uh, even more serious than stealing property. 
So we have to be very careful about stealing of minds and stealing of time when we go shopping, especially and when we have no intention. Now, if you, if you nonetheless want to do that, there is a way out. You go to the salesman and you say to the salesman, I want you to know, I have no intention of buying any shirts here. But if it's not going to steal your time and if you don't have any, if it goes according to store policy, whatever it, can you explain to me what the shirt is all about and whether if, it, if he decides then, if your intentions were made very clear and he decides then to dedicate time and it doesn't take him away from other customers because he might say one thing, but maybe there's a store policy again, says that the employees have to work for the benefit of the store, not for the benefit of some joint schmo that has questions about shirts. So, so if, if all of that has been cleared, then you can nonetheless, then you can continue and ask the questions that you have about the shirt. Now, I'll uh, finish this answer by saying that, um, and I say this to my children, that's why I'm giving myself permission to say this. Uh, I just had a conversation about uh, my, uh, with my son about Black Friday. He too wants to go shopping Black Friday and he's already looking into all these uh, electronic accessories of the best thing to buy for his computer, whatever it is, and Bose uh, ear set and whatever it is. And I said to him, gosh, I wish people would spend more time, not just in what their body needs, but in the same amount of time, not just in what their body needs, but in what their soul needs. Our soul also needs to go shopping, not just our body. So let's ask not just about shirts for bodies, but let's ask about shirts for souls. What does a soul really want? I said to my son, I'll engage in any conversation you have, uh, you want to have about Bose ear sets, uh, headsets, whatever they call. But let's also engage the same amount of time about what type of hearing your soul also needs. Maybe it, hears, it needs hearing of, of Torah's words, of uh, prayers. Of course, you can imagine he loved that. But it's just a fact of life. Just as our bodies as its needs, as they need, our souls also have their needs. And let's pay attention to shopping for our souls as much as we shop for our bodies. And then those Fridays won't be Black Fridays, but those Fridays we spend for our souls will be White Fridays because it's the favorite color of the soul, color of purity.